August 1961, a heavily laden barge moves slowly down a river in the heart of America's Southland. Its cargo, the first model of Saturn, America's largest space vehicle. Too big for shipment by any other means, Saturn was being moved along a 2,000-mile water route from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama to Cape Canaveral, Florida. There it was to make the first flight in the Saturn test program. August 15, 1958 was the date work on Saturn officially began. It was to be the first large rocket developed specifically for scientific space programs, an important early step in the United States' plans to land men on the moon. Just three years later, this first test vehicle, called SA-1, arrived at the Cape to prepare for the initial flight, a flight that had to be successful if America's lunar program was to proceed on schedule. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, Dr. Werner von Braun and the other men who directed the development of the Saturn project looked forward to the first test launch. They were eager to confirm the entirely new technology of large rocket design and construction. Saturn's design called for a huge multi-stage vehicle four times more powerful than any other rocket then in use. It featured an unusual power concept, clustered engines of proven reliability. The first 10 Saturns, designated C1 type, were scheduled to have a cluster of eight engines adapted from the Thor-Jupiter programs. Four engines were mounted rigidly inboard and four mounted outboard on gimbals that moved to control the vehicle's attitude during flight. Each engine was capable of 188,000 pounds of thrust for a total booster thrust of a million and a half pounds. Later, more advanced C5 Saturns were to be powered by five engines, each one capable of a million and a half pounds of thrust or a total thrust of seven and a half million pounds. An important part of the clustered engine concept was the propellant feed system, designed to assure a successful flight even though one of the engines might fail to perform properly. The fuel and oxidizer that would have been consumed by a dead engine would be made available to the others, and the burning time automatically lengthened to compensate for the lower level of thrust. The ultimate goal of the Saturn space giant was to thrust the three-man Apollo spacecraft on the first leg of its journey to the moon. But there were many steps toward the advanced Saturn that would make this journey. An important milestone for the Saturn project came in April 1960, when a static test firing of the booster rocket proved that the clustered engine concept was sound. But the real test for Saturn was to come here at Cape Canaveral on the newly completed 45-acre Launch Complex 34, largest known rocket launching site in the world. August 15, 1961, three years to the day since the program began, launch site personnel made preparations to erect this first huge test rocket. The first section moved into place was the booster stage that would power the first test vehicle. This was to be the first of 10 proposed C-1 test flights that would show how the clustered engines performed in flight, how the structure of the vehicle's airframe behaved, how the guidance and control systems functioned, how the launch facilities and ground support equipment operated. In this first flight test, only the booster, or first stage, was to be powered. A non-powered, dummy second stage would be added, together with a dummy third stage, and a dummy payload where the Apollo spacecraft would eventually be carried. Future, fully powered Saturns would thrust Apollo into an orbit around the Earth, and eventually advanced Saturns would launch Apollo on the first part of the journey to the moon. But the first test flights were to check only the powered booster, the flight plan called for a booster burnout about 60 miles above the Earth, with the resulting trajectory that would carry the dummy stages to a peak altitude of about 90 miles, and back to Earth approximately 225 miles from liftoff point. The flight was planned to last about eight minutes, with a maximum velocity of 3,700 miles an hour. 
an inertial guidance system was to keep the vehicle on its course. Once the powered booster was in place, the upper stages arrived at the launch site and were hoisted into position, later to be filled with water as ballast for the first flight. The upper stages would be tested with live engines later in the 10 launch series. Finally, the dummy nose cone was moved into place. In the later test launches in this first series, this nose cone would be replaced by early models of the Apollo spacecraft. With all stages in place, this first Saturn SA-1 stood 163 feet high in the Florida sky, taller than a 15-story building. Weighing in at 925,000 pounds, it was ready to prove it could do the job it was designed to do. Dr. Von Braun and his associates from the National Aeronautics and Space Administration were on hand to observe the performance of the space giant. They knew that despite successful static firings, there were many, many chances for something to go wrong in flight. They believed there was only a 50-50 chance of success for this first critical launch. October 27th, 1961 day of the launch. The nearby beaches were crowded with curious people who had come to watch Saturn's first test flight. Television cameras were in place, ready to bring the launch to interested viewers throughout the United States. And the newsmen were gathered to report the success or the failure of the launching to people throughout the world. A few hours before the launch, final fueling of the vehicle took place. Liquid oxygen and kerosene were pumped aboard. Launch time, minus one hour. Fueling was completed. Now Saturn had everything it needed to do its job. In just 60 minutes, it would lift off and head up into space, if all went according to plan. Launch time, minus one minute. Saturn was ready. The final 60 seconds of the countdown began. 42 and a half, 42 and a half, 43. 8 KC operator. Lock runner on. Lock runner on. 45. Lock tank pressurized. Jumping three seconds. Okay, power transfer complete. Top plug disconnected. 15. Stand by for ignition sequence. Lock mask retracted. 3, 2, 1. Zero. From the very first, performance met all expectations. There were no technical holds during countdown. All eight engines operated for full duration. And seven miles up, the vehicle passed the point of maximum dynamic pressure, a critical moment of flight. Saturn's first test flight fulfilled all its objectives. But space vehicle engineers know that a single successful flight may just be luck. It takes more to prove success. Two flights begin to give data to measure and compare. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, work was proceeding on the second Saturn test vehicle to ready it for flight testing six months later. One part of the extensive testing program was carried out in a new pressure test facility. Here, NASA technicians checked tanks and mechanical systems with air, helium, and nitrogen at pressure levels up to 3,000 pounds per square inch.
once again, static test firings were important steps in the checkout program at Marshall. The second Saturn vehicle successfully completed all the tests at Marshall. It was prepared for shipment to the launching area. Again, the trip by barge down the 2,000 mile water route to Cape Canaveral. This second Saturn, designated SA-2, was identical to the first vehicle, except for minor improvements. On February 27, 1962, the launch crew at Pad 34 began to erect SA-2 and prepare it for flight. The second Saturn had quite a task to perform here at the Cape, go through a 12-hour countdown with no technical delays, duplicate the unqualified success of the SA-1 booster firing, perform to full expectation in flight. Only when it did would NASA engineers know for certain that the success of the first launch was more than luck and that they could proceed with the development of Saturn according to the original schedule. The flight plan for this second Saturn was essentially the same as the first. Only the booster would be tested live. Again, it would burn out at an altitude of about 60 miles. Ordinarily, this would mean a trajectory of about 88 miles and an impact point about 225 miles out in the Atlantic. However, there was one additional experiment in this second test. After booster burnout, the Saturn vehicle was to be deliberately destroyed at about 65 miles altitude. This would release into the upper atmosphere of the 95 tons of water carried as ballast in the upper stages. This experiment, called Project High Water, would let NASA scientists observe what happens when a large volume of water is released in the near vacuum of the upper atmosphere and would contribute to our knowledge of high altitude physics. April 25th, 1962, the day of the second launch. Finally, SA-2 stood alone, free from its gantry, ready for flight. Jumping three seconds. Okay, power transfer complete. Top plug disconnected. Okay. Power for connection. Retracted. Four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. second test launch duplicated the first. Again, Saturn had met all performance expectations. Project Highwater was also accomplished successfully. Now that these first two experimental space giants had met their test objectives, what was next for America's lunar program? At the Marshall Space Flight Center, work proceeded on schedule as new models of Saturn were being readied for flight test. The immediate goal of the lunar program was to put two and three man spacecraft into Earth orbit as quickly as possible. Then larger, more powerful Saturns would carry Apollo to the vicinity of the moon. The success of SA-1 and the success of SA-2 have been two giant steps toward the not too distant day when America's vast lunar program will accomplish its objectives.